Okay, it's the right time to start, apparently. My name is uh, John Jordan, and I work you know, for the province of British Columbia, Canada. And uh, so we're going to talk, it's going to be mostly Tobias, but I wanted to have a chance to introduce the idea here. So, so you know, the BC government is a pretty typical enterprise. It's like 30,000 people work for the BC government, and we have lots and lots of applications inside, and we have uh, single sign-on services based on Active Directory and SiteMinder CA and awful things like that. Um, but we also have a new um, digital platform that we operate uh, on um, Red Hat Evolution, which is a uh, kind of a cloud native platform that we run in our data center. And as we're doing that, and we're learning how to build applications and sort of a digital product team with you know, continuous improvement and so forth, um, those applications and developers were struggling to integrate with the legacy identity management systems. And so uh, on the platform, we operate a service called Code, which is a Red Hat product, open source product, that does you know, identity access management, role-based identity access management. And you can integrate that with a variety of identity providers, so very traditional, uh, you know, federated identity type of solution. And so that made things a little bit better. Um, and, you know, in, in that context, uh, developers understand how to do things with OpenID Connect, and they have uh, some administrative control over their Red Hat, and the code realm, and define roles, and so forth. So the goal here was, uh, how do we how do we make, the, our goal is always how do we make the lift for our developers as little as possible. My colleague Peter Watkins would say there's no terraforming of IT systems allowed. We can't open up these legacy apps, some of them are mainframe still, and we need them to be able to move into the modern world. And that's where this idea came up. So the idea here is that an application developer can continue to use OpenID Connect, can continue to use the services of Keycloak, or in fact, we designed it thanks to these two guys, the clever guys, that it could be whatever uh, IAM, so Ford Rock, Google, whatever, um, thanks to standards. And, um, but at the same time, be able to uh, use verifiable credentials out of the wild. So um, that's, what, that's what our goal was. And part of what was driving us was the use case we're looking at with the Law Society of British Columbia, where they're going to be able to issue a digital practicing certificate to lawyers. And lawyers are going to be able to use that digital practicing certificate, verifiable credentials, to prove that they're lawyers for PC court services, so they can gain access to court recordings. So that's kind of our behind the scenes use case. We'll talk a bit about that. And, uh, and I think that, oh, and the, the last thing is with the way we do this, and I think you will talk a little bit about this too, Tobias. Um, we have a, a, a procurement me mechanism in BC called Code With Us. And what it is, is when you can define a use case or a story, a user story, well defined, it, um, you can make that available through uh, to, in the public through our BC Dev Exchange. Uh, and it's a GitHub issue as well. And, developed, and we put a price on it. So in this case, we said for $50,000, we'll pay for somebody to build us this thing. Find the thing, and it takes a couple of days to go through the procurement process, and then we assign it to a developer, and they write the code, and then once we submit, we receive the code and merge it, we pay. So it's kind of an open source down mechanism and a tool we use to times that allows us to gain access to the global experts. So. Awesome. Thanks for that. So yeah, as John. Um, Introduced when we started out, we were looking at uh, ways to integrate into IAM landscapes primarily, and, and during this sort of scoping, we, we've sort of come up with the way that we want to describe this work, which is um, verifiable credential based authentication over OpenID Connect. Um, so, a bit of a bit of a background into that. Um, as John said, it was spun out of the uh, COVID us opportunity, and the problem statement as I said, was around IAM providers. And the goal was kind of to try and achieve this in the most generalized way possible. So we didn't really want to build an integration that only worked for Keycloak um, and didn't work anywhere else. And so that kind of inspired the design that we ended up taking. So for those that don't know uh, what verifiable credentials are, they're obviously, they're, they're basically a spec that's uh, in what's called proposed recommendation state at the W3C currently. And they define a data model to represent credentials in a way that's um, cryptographically verifiable. Well, 
and they have two different sort of serialization formats for those that are interested in, in that aspect, which is JSON LD and, uh, and Jose. And they've got a variety of different uh, signature mechanisms that you can employ with them, including things like uh, zero knowledge proofs. This is kind of what a verifiable credential ecosystem is about. You've got three main sort of roles. You've got an issuer, a holder, and a relying party or a, a verifier. And you've basically got someone who issues. Uh, you've got the involvement of a verifiable data registry, which is often uh, a decentralized ledger or um, some other form of uh, registry with those sorts of properties. And you go through an issuance process and then a presentation process. And the verifier or the relying party has the ability to verify these credentials back to the issuer. For those, I'm sure there's probably a lot, of, there's maybe a bit of a varied knowledge in here, but a lot of people will know exactly what OpenID Connect is, so I'll be rehashing it. But essentially, it's an authentication protocol, uh, like an identity sort of protocol on top of OpenID Connect. Um, and we chose this when we were looking at the integration because you know there is a standard basic uh, a standard protocol that is defined between a relying party and an, and an open ID connect provider that uh, doesn't define the method of authentication for one because that's that's how open ID connect was designed it was supposed to create innovation at that layer and uh, create support for a multitude of different authentication mechanisms um, it's got broad usage in industry. All of the major IAM providers uh, and beyond already use this technology. And the spec's flexible enough that it allowed us to expand it to uh, work with this method of, uh, of authentication. And so some of the sort of problems that I think John sort of alluded to is that we don't really have a standardized way to share verifiable credentials or claims on the web from one authority to another. There's, uh, there's different sort of specs uh, out there that are evolving around assurance levels and that sort of stuff. But uh, this, was, this work was in part sort of defining and uh, attempting to solve that problem. Um, there's, there's a lack of a standard protocol in explicit, uh, in explicitly in OpenID Connect. And part of this is about now that we have verifiable credentials as a specification defined, we need a low barrier to entry to enable the usage of verifiable credentials in this ecosystem. So we were about trying to find a way to actually get verifiable credentials into browsers and into web-based interactions in a really easy to do way. And so we thought that because OpenID is already prolifically in use, that creating an implementation that expands that specification was an easy way to uh, enable people to unlock the power of verifiable credentials. Uh, and on a side note, in terms of how we potentially federate it to verifiable claims, there's, there's multiple different models. You can actually federate out to a provider that may have these verified claims and retrieve them on a user. And uh, there, there are plenty of people that feel like that has a uh, the provider stuck in the middle of the authentication loop and therefore there are uh, concerns about how that paradigm might evolve and so this paradigm because the user is in greater possession of the verifiable credentials directly uh, and they are presenting them through this service uh, there is no provider stuck between regulating them being able to disclose these verifiable claims about themselves and hence identify online and that's kind of about the data portability aspect that verifiable credentials themselves try to solve. So the solution we came up with was essentially to just extend a standard OpenID Connect provider. So OpenID Connect provider is like the main server that, you, that a relying party requests authentication with. Um, and we basically extended the protocol to support a new method of authentication, where the method of authentication was using verifiable credentials. Uh, this provider acts as just an OpenID Connect provider, but once the request goes to it to draw a line back to the verifiable credential ecosystem, it then acts as a verifier. So it, well, it, it presents a request to the user to, pre to uh, present verifiable credentials, and then it carries out the necessary 
um, checking on the credentials in order to see whether or not they satisfy the relying party's request before returning a response that the relying party can interpret. So this flows probably pretty familiar to some. You have an OIDC request from a relying party to an OpenID Connect provider. This is just a VC or Thin based provider. That provider translate that, translates that into what's called a verifiable credential request and expresses that to the identity wallet. Uh, QR code is, is, uh, is the way that we are doing it right now. You can use deep links. There are a multitude of other methods that could express this request across. That contains information, so the identity wallet can then process that, which is in possession and, and under, under the control of the uh, user who the credentials are about. They can then prepare a verifiable credential presentation based on that request, if they wish to satisfy it, send back that response. The OpenID Connect provider then verifies that presentation, and once they have verified and if it's successful, they'll send back a standard OADC response. Um, so to talk now about how we actually did the integration with BCGov, the landscape before, is really, they have Key Cloak as their deployed IAM. It does all of the authorization. They have a multitude of different identity providers, such as GitHub and Azure AD, that they interface through, through the OpenID Connect protocol. And then they have an applications ecosystem that obviously hooks into Key Cloak as their IDP. And essentially, all we did was uh, deployed another service and uh, configured from a drop down in Key Cloak to point at this new service as a new IDP, and it, uh, and it kind of does the rest. And so what I'll do now really quickly is just a quick demo of that up and running. So this here is um, a law society. Ah. So this here is a, this is a single sign-on page generated by uh, BCGov's dev instance of Keycloak in their domain. As you can see, uh, Keycloak, there's three identity providers configured for this application. At the moment, you've got IDIR, which is one of their providers, GitHub, and then this new provider we've configured called Verifiable Credential. I'm just going to see if I can uh, click that. I'm going to have to, oh, I've got no internet. Okay. <laughs> well, if I was connected to the internet, something more interesting would have happened than that. Uh, give me two seconds. <laughs> okay, great. So I'm going to have to scan this from up here. But essentially, what you've got is a Request, which is just a, it's just a proof request, basically uh, expressing this intent over to the identity wallet. Uh, and if I accept it, we're now authenticated. So what, what that's done is it, it um, the landing page was, was key cloaks, uh, configuring all the IDPs. You clicked on one, it federated out to it for authentication because it's configured to use verifiable credentials as the, as the authentication mechanism, it rendered that challenge. And on that response, the relying party in this instance, well the first relying party is Keycloak, it sends back the identity token, rely, uh, Keycloak then processes that and then this application is in an, in, in an authenticated state. So. I will just jump back on to the idea of behind the like sessions. So like once you're logged in, uh, is it gonna yep. be like cookie sessions or like So in this case, because you've got Keycloak, Keycloak's managing your session, right? Because you like, you know, when you go to uh, well, you've got kind of two layers of sessions, I suppose, whether or not you have a session with your um, original original IDP, but you also have a, a session layer with Keycloak because um, You've, you've passed through them. So I'll just jump to the end. Then we'll jump 
two years of development. <laughs> 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 two million demos. <laughs> Uh, so where we're at next with this sort of project is um, we want to work with, um, there's, a, there's a couple of obviously open sort of pending standards in the uh, um, foundation at the moment that are solving a similar problem and we want to try and work with them to kind of standardise the request shape from the relying party to the OP. Um, obviously the second half which is the OP talking to the identity agent is a is a protocol that many of us in this decentralized identity landscape are trying to solve. DIDCOM is one of the words we refer to it as, um, and there's a big active conversation about completely standardizing that so we can get ubiquitous integration across multiple mobile wallets. And so there is work to be done there. And, and lastly, um, there's an open source referen reference implementation available that we're still working on to refine um, that you can go and check out and comment on and give us feedback on the approach. So with that, uh, any questions? So the, can you just describe in as much detail as possible what identifiers Keycloak sees at the end of the IDP process? So here? Yep. So uh, the provider outputs an ID token. Um, well, you know, depend, the ultimate product of it is an ID token. It uses back channel um, when, in this potential, uh, in this particular um, flow. But um, the ID token, you kind of, on the request, uh, so basically in the request the relying party makes to the open ID provider, they, they kind of define um, some properties about the ID token. So which verifiable claims they want and the ID, well, which ones which ones they want the user to present, um, and then how they kind of translate into the ID token. So kind of, at the moment, the verifiable claims are just getting normalized out of the presentation into the ID token and sent back. So the attributes are available back to the relying party. As scope requests on the as, as a scope request? Yeah, right. and, and the request object, how do you make the request? Oh, so the request. Sure like some. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if I've got an example on hand, but it's like, so the request object at the moment, we had to expand it to take, to take a, a more elaborate sort of um, request object to basically say, I want these verifiable, I want this claim, and it has this constraints, you know, it must come from this issuer, uh, or must be satisfied from this sort of schema. Um, and the way we've done that for now is we, uh, we were in conversations last night actually about an approach to, because we didn't want to actually embed that into the entire request, so we have, uh, you can basically set that proof request shape up so it's reusable, and then you reference it via a query parameter, a new query parameter that comes in the, uh, in the OpenID Connect request, because the idea is sometimes you want to recycle the same authentication challenges over and over. If, you, if you'll say BCGov and you've got multiple applications that are connecting to this service they're running in their domain and multiple of them uh, have the same authentication rules. You know, the same mixture of verifiable credentials they weren't presented. Um, you might not want to have to pump that into a big OIDC request every single time and so it would be nice to dereference it by some form of identifier and so this is... Stay tuned in the next session we'll talk about how to... How to yeah, exactly. But if I got it right, then, then the, the reliant party that only specifies the claims, it wants to obtain, but also the sources. Yes. The issuers. Yes. Okay. They, so they impose... That in OpenID Connect philosophy, the IDP is not the, ID, or it's not the claims provider, it's, it's no. someone else. No, so the, so the VC or then OpenID provider is acting as a verifiable credential verifier, but they are not an IDP. Yeah, that's towards the blue, uh, the blue thing, but yeah. first the reliant party is the OP. Well, it yeah. takes responsibility of the content of the ID token. Yeah. My assumption would be in an open ID technology, I would match that, map, map that to aggregated or distributed content. Yeah. Yeah, it's similar. So yeah. Content directed because that typically means the IDP takes liability or the LP takes liability for that. Well, yeah. So the liability is in question. The, the approach we've taken for well, now. Testing. It's it's the testing then. Yes. Let's not talk about legal terms. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so for now, what we've done is the trust relationship. We've kind of remained untouched. So we we treat this as 
this VC Authy and OpenID provider as the verifier and it normalizes to an ordinary ID token. So if you asked it to challenge this user to present credentials um, that satisfy certain constraints, the response you get back doesn't give you all the evidence to do that. You're trusting that they do it because in, in, in the instances we're after, you'll be running this service inside your own domain anyway, so you'd be, uh, it's, it's acting on your behalf in your own ecosystem anyway. So, um, and pumping all that evidence into an ID token, uh, we're open to doing, it's really just defining how that ID token, uh, how that should look and how the evidence should be expressed. All right, would you say that there's a separation between what the relying, how the relying party wants the user, like what claims that the relying party wants the user to use to verify their identity, separated from the claims that the mechanisms already exist of what the relying party wants back, right? I mean, it's like, it seems like there's two separate things. There is, right? yeah. There's, and you could potentially represent the, the, like if you created sets of them, it gets a little bit harder if you want it to be arbitrary all the time. Mm. You could use like the ATR and those kinds of mechanisms to say, you know, I need this kind of a proof, mm -hmm. right, as the mechanism in the OpenID Connect request. Yeah. And then, and then you could use the claims parameter to say these are the claims I want back. Exactly. So that's that's like uh, I believe you guys are doing with the identity assurance stuff is kind of aggregating that into say like a trust framework or something like that. It's like saying. You don't, ha you don't want to have to verbosely describe every single time in your request exactly what you're after. You kind of want to reference it by like a, an agreed upon identifier. Drummond? I'm kind of remembering that at least there are contexts like these different applications, there's specific services. So like the VC, you know, access to audio cart services application knows that it wants a lawyer. So it knows that it wants a practicing certificate credential from the Law Society of British Columbia or maybe from Alberta as well, and it knows what is going to be in those. So there's a, there's a configuration there for its open ID, like on VC sure. and open ID provider, kind of like generalized to the internet, it's specific to the enterprise app. Mm. But in that particular context, is it, is the relying party, are, are you looking at having the relying party say, don't even give me a bear, don't even basically give me an authenticated user if they don't have if right. they can't prove that they're an X. Yeah, yeah right? absolutely. Which is separate from saying authenticate them and then you give me the claim back yeah, no, that it's, says they don't you know get they past are. the green thing yeah. if they can't provide the proof. Okay. The, well, there, there, are, there, are, there are active discussions about synergizing this with, um, with some of the other efforts that are going on, SIOP and, um, and DidAuth and that sort of stuff that would create that behavior so that you'd at a minimum always get a did back and you'd always get an authenticated user and you just wouldn't get the verified claims and then the relying party interprets what that means. But um, yeah, this is, we decided to tackle this because um, getting verified claims and verifiable credentials into the browser and into these interactions we thought was um, valuable. I would just, I'll, yeah, Drummond? I was just gonna <coughs> clarify and make sure that I'm <coughs> understanding this that this diagram is very simple, but from an open ID perspective, it's actually very deceptive because what looks like an open ID provider there in the middle is not a conventional open ID provider. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's actually inside the firewall, the domain of the relying part, of the relying part right? Yeah. yeah. It is Correct. serving a translation service. Okay. Yeah. And so therefore, right, but there's no reason it couldn't be. Authentication is it's out of scope for OpenID Connect. So there's nothing wrong from an OpenID Connect perspective to uh, OpenID Connect yeah. provider. It's actually a pretty common pattern. Yeah, I, I think what Drummond's trying to point out, and correct me if I'm wrong here, is that if uh, the VC Authent OIDC provider was a separate legal entity or a separate company to VC Garbright and they were federating out, then that OP would see quite a lot of user data. <laughs> of all of the different authentication challenges. And so for all intents and purposes, yeah, the preferred uh, implementation pattern we think would preserve privacy better is if someone's already running an IAM solution, right? They already have this spun up on OpenID. They just spin one of these up like we did in, open, in the OpenShift environment and then just configure the IAM to say that's another method of authentication. To me, that aspect is basically a deployment aspect. Yeah, yeah. We, yeah totally, totally. Whether 
the privacy exactly not, right? we're not we can have that conversation yeah. I mean, that's what we're gonna leave, right? yeah we're not we're not we're not we enforcing that topology that in our product yeah. impact yeah. assessment and yes to say like you know user data is going to be seen here yeah i still don't understand why you commented that that the, the, the green box had to be within the firewall well, no, no, I just, I, I wasn't, yeah, I, no, there, no. No. Just the approach, there, there. I was, it was just that, it was just I mean, the, from my perspective, any IDP yeah. could use an identity wallet as source of clients. Right, so that's absolutely. Just, exactly. It's just a gateway that has yeah. the role of yeah. OP, so correct. what it does behind the scenes, who cares? Yeah, yeah correct. I, I'm not, like, and the clarification is I'm not imposing that, that's, that's the architecture. In this particular implementation, and it's a, it's a consideration to be aware of when you're deploying it. But yeah. Uh. Okay, so uh, two questions, or oh, one comment, one question. So uh, back in 2013 or 2014, we did a very similar project. Uh, that's by SP7 uh, funding. And uh, you know, the Japanese initial application is exactly like this, except the claims provider was speaking like uh, open claims. The claims are coming back as I told. And it's um, it's compiled with uh, aggregated claims. Yeah. Okay. okay. And returns. The the question I have here is this time you are returning verifiable verifiable claims. Yeah, it could be verified claims. Uh, well. Yeah, it could be verified claims. So no. <laughs> well, anyway, but uh, uh, so I had an impression that the this middle guy, the green guy, is doing some kind of translation. Yeah. Yes. They are. So they, like this our agent and an identity service so server yeah. combined so my question, together. My question, my question is, does the signature get broken by that translation? So, so, so the signatures don't get returned in the ID token. The relying party is trusting. They they feder they said challenge the user in the following way and make sure that they present the following credentials and just give me the claims back in the ID token. The trust relationship, yeah, the trust relationship's exactly the same as what you have when you you federate out to GitHub or some other provider and you say you know. So in my case, yeah, the green guy is not was not from the right party side. Yes. Domain was an independent one. So. We yeah. couldn't break the signatures. So we're in our we're in our trust domain in our case. Yeah. And this is part of our infrastructure for how we yeah. Yeah. authenticate and authorize users. And the and the other thing just to point out is we didn't the reason we did that and we didn't return those signatures is we didn't actually want to muck with the ID token too much, right? People know how to consume them, they know how to sort of interpret these claims. Um, we're open to doing that. We just want to make sure that however we do that doesn't like disrupt everyone that already uses OADC. Thomas Lavin, you're your first. Uh, who is the ID token issue to specifically because it's the subject of the token and yeah. does it support um, not revealing uh, the ID Yes. Very, very good questions. So the, um, the, the uh, types of verifiable credentials that this is asking at the moment is the uh, ZKP based ones uh, from the Indy project. Um, and so there's a DIDCOM sort of presentation request that we're yet to formally standardise with the rest of the verifiable credentials ecosystem. Um, so selective disclosure is, is, is occurring there. Um, and then there are multiple options and the subject is one of the most interesting observations because if the, ID, the identity wallet, if they presented a DID back, so they did an authenticated response back where they uh, and included in the verifiable presentation, they had like a decentralized identifier that identifies them, then use that as the subject. Uh, if if there, is, there are certain modes where um, at the moment that are being discussed around anonymous um, response, where you don't have an identifier, and then you're left with two options. You either nominate a claim that was presented to be your identifier, and then that that shifts the responsibility on the relying party to make sure that it's unique in a global context, or you tell the OpenID provider to generate a good at random, and then you've stomped on your ability to have repeat sessions for the same user presenting the same claims. And so there are kind of three options at the moment, and we're in active discussions about uh, which ones, and, and that's why it's great to have members of the OpenID Connect community here to uh, elaborate on the dangers of some of those models. So.
My original question around what Equo sees about that subject for the claim for the ID token that it's issuing, right? I want to know everything that Equo knows about the subject. You know, like so, what do they see? So they, they, they get an ID token where a subject field, as I said, the subject is one of those three different things. Right. And then any claims that they requested in the, in the request yeah. are just ordinary claims in the ID so token. All of those, all of those claims, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, well, it's what they've requested, right? And, and it's what's going to be useful information in the authenticated session. So like you'll see in that, you would have seen probably in that demo we did, my first and last name was... Um, so if I just close this, you'll see my first and last names available at the top there, and those have come from standard first and last name claims. Because in the presentation request, the verifiable credential that I presented, I presented my first and last name. But it's like to the point of like information disclosure, if this were not all in the same plus domain, you might be concerned about Correct. You know, those claims coming from a third party. You know, I mean, maybe it's a business agreement, you know, we'll all sign BAAs and healthcare case, like, yeah. but still you would be sort of concerned about mapping that translation. Correct. In the subject case, could you not just pass the client ID? In, in the context of a more wider ecosystem deployment, <coughs> pass the client ID in the request to the to the wallet to effectively say this is the entity that's requesting the the um oh no yeah so and, yeah, so you and then if it needs to create a pairwise did right for that user then in that context you would always get a feedback because that's probably yeah. the subject that yeah you could have an ephemeral would be correlatable yeah. across multiple yeah. lines yeah. yeah well so it's a, it's so, so it's yeah, 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 no, that's right. Yeah, it, and, and that is an option. You could ephemerally generate um, DIDs based on presentations. Um, if you were so inclined, there's discussions about, you know, that's undermining you know civil resistance and those sorts of things potentially and uh, but it's it's like holding multiple accounts for the same provider and authenticating with different ones in different contexts right so yeah uh, I think you're maybe oh so a point of clarification is W3Spec defines the data model on how a verifiable credential looks. The protocol, it's not a protocol spec. The protocol that this uh, VC Authent OpenID provider to the identity wallet and back, uh, there is, Aries is currently building uh, DIDCOM, there are active discussions about um, having that, pardon? There is no protocol. Like, well, well, there are multiple, there are multiple people. From a standards body that but there's there's multiple people that already have active implementations that work together, but increasing that interoperability and ratifying that in standard is in process. Come to DidCom today if you want to learn all about it. <laughs> Hold on, sorry. Might be a stupid question, but could the green green could the identity wallet uh, or the uh, open ID provider create a job? Could it? Could it? Could the? Yeah, an additional job that this could be put in the ID token as an aggregated claim. Yeah. I'm asking. Because yes, if you wanted to submit the evidence back. The identity wallet or the issuer or some some yeah. derived key to be used to sign the, the claims. That would be, from my perspective, right. an inter a very interesting option, especially in the area Correct. of identity assurance. Yeah, yeah, so you're saying, so you're saying um, the evidence that the identity wallet provided to this provider should be available in the ID token? Absolutely. So you could do that. The, the, the prerequisite, if, if it shall, shall fit in existing Open ID Connect technology, yeah. then it must be a job. Yes. That's the only prerequisite. Okay. And the relying party must have a way to determine the key and the issuer mm -hmm. sign that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so the subject ID has to be a little unique for that's the requirement. Can you speak up a bit, please? The, <laughs> <laughs> the, the subject ID has to be globally unique, and that's the OP 
deep thermal room. I can't issue a token unless I can guarantee that that, that identifier is below the DB. Yeah. Which you can if it's dead or like a publicly resolved. Yeah, but I can't send it back yeah. to make it the relying party problem. That, yeah. that option that you mentioned. Uh, yeah, they, they, that's why I brought them all up and said I, I am aware of the constraints. I'm just uh, that's just promoting the discussions and the options that we've identified. Exactly. Yeah. So. OIDC SIOP does exactly that. The ID token that's returned is signed by the, the original wallet, right? And so yeah, so OIDC, to draw parallels uh, to it, is, is really when the identity wallet becomes its own open ID provider. And, and the kind of the relying party, they, they collapse, right? You, you, you get rid of the middle and you've got a, a direct conversation between the two. and. Um, We've looked at SOP extensively, and our sort of impression of it right now is it was based for authentication-based yeah. challenges, really, at the moment. And so um, the support for semantics around sort of more arbitrary message definitions but, and interactions in general between identity wallets, we didn't feel like there was enough semantic support to start going, oh, we'll do issuance and presentation and everything in that at present, right? We feel that's that's why the discussions of DIDCOM and all of that's going on. Because it's just one potential architecture. You don't need to block them. Because you can yeah. keep them and just use the, the, the identity model as an additional claim storage. That's why we have this aggregated and distributed claims and open ID connect solutions. Yeah. It seems we found a use case for that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, in our business case, from an assurance perspective, if you're talking about like risk to mm -hmm. the party, there's the definition, like when they decide what they're asking for and who they're asking it from, they make that decision right there. They're deciding, I trust the issuance process of the BC Law Society, mm. and I'm also trusting the technological means by which those bits are being transferred to my green thing, and once that's satisfied, they're good. I understand that. Yeah. It's kind of an implicit attestation. Yeah. 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 I'm more looking into explicit attestations, so yeah. you can also potentially put that into your audit log. You can see, okay, this data yes. came from that origin, sure. and I can trace it back. Yep. So the Absolutely. You can do that here as well, yeah. but you have to have a corresponding yep. audit log on the on the, on the Correct. Yeah. 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 Correct. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, what advantage do you think uh, third parties like Gemini tokens? You mean as the response of yeah. which which phase? So uh, you you responding to the, uh, the request from green uh, blue is responding with uh, verifiable claims. Right. Verifiable credentials. So yeah. Verifiable yeah. credentials. Yeah. Yeah. All right. What's the um, what's the advantage of it over just using plain jot? Over plain jots. Yeah. So if you go and have a look at the verifiable credentials, they define basically an abstract data model. And then they define two serialization formats. One of them is a JOT-based um, format, and one is JSON-LD. Um, there are sort of multiple different benefits and, and stronger definition of properties around the explicit sort of vertical verifiable credentials we're after tackling that are kind of like a more kind of scoped, defined JWT, I guess, for the purposes of verifiable credentials as a data model. But to answer your question, a verifiable credential can be serialized as a JOT in the W3C spec, if you want to take that. But I mean, um, from, a, from a business perspective, the advantage is uh, we're relying on the membership management of, the, of whoever is issuing the verifiable credential. That lawyer doesn't need to have an account with us. There's no account with the BC government anymore. It's just we trust that the law society or the doctors you know, the medical practitioners or the nurses or teachers or lawyer engineers, they're managing the issuance of their credentials appropriately, and we're relying on that. Mm. So, that so they don't need to have an account with us. Right? Yeah. yeah. But it, I don't think, yeah, but, the, but you know, that's just the means by which the bits get It's just a serialization right? format, I guess. From a business uh, perspective. So if you don't want to really identify which doctor or something like that, yeah. you could just as well use group signature. Like that, as a tiny thing. Yeah. 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 I mean, there's there's multiple different ways that you can leverage them. Yeah. But I mean, verifiable credentials is a is a W3C spec that's that's about the holder issuer verifier paradigm, and creating kind of like a robust way to create an ecosystem based on those premises. But yeah, there's a variety of different ways you could accomplish the signatures. Yeah.
it. The, the other one is, uh, I don't know how to avoid the new protocol to be clear. Just plain balls. Yeah. Oh, because we want peer-to-peer -peer trusted connections. We don't want middlemen. So, so. Oh, OAuth is a middleman. It's, no. it's a login service. So it's just a REST call. The, 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 the identity wallet might be a little bit. So how, how does it connect to it? So at the moment we're just doing, at the moment the QR code is a self-encapsulated message with where to send the response. Kind of like a PSYOP request, right? It has a callback URL. It's exactly the same. And, and you, whether or not you send that over a REST request because a mobile component of your wallet is hosted or something like that, that's always an option. But the message itself, needs to be probably be able to be transmitted over REST or put in a QR code or embedded on a web page as a deep link. Um, so there's a variety of ways to invoke it. Exactly. If, if, if you were yeah. at doing the verification in this did OP, then you could just do off with o, open ID and DIGS and everything would be fine. The problem is that you are presenting verifiable presentations that have to be reviewed before you're gonna issue an open ID valid ID token. But yeah. as soon as you have to do that, there is a thing that you have to account for that is not an open ID, that is well, not well defined. You, know, you, you have an implementation of it yeah. that, that like, solves but, the issue. But it's, it's the management of the verifiable claims and, and translating them or embedding them. As soon as you do that in the ID token, you have to explain why, why you've had to do that. And you can't use open ID language to do it unless you use Unless the format is like this distributor aggregate claims language, yeah. which is a thing that you could do for it. Yeah. Right. But don't we have that on your technical? <coughs> You're talking about the identity assurance oh, yeah. one? Don't, don't we have that from the identity assurance that's getting away of requesting verified claims for sure. the trust sure. framework? Yeah. yeah. So why yeah. I mean, that error was fine. No, no. So, so sorry, no, the arrow between the relying party and the VC or thin open ID provider is defined and back, but that's not really the same sort of structure that needs to be defined between the open ID provider and identity wallet. You could, you could, you can take inspiration from that, but it's my my understanding of the spec so far in terms of of, of how we reference verifiable claims off verifiable credentials. It's not completely um, the same right now, but that's exactly yeah. why we had a conversation last night and uh, it's not a collaboration. Yeah, it's okay. yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> Well, it, if you could share some language or concept on the line, yeah. it would be great. Yeah. 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 So, you know, I still need to understand what is the right? I still don't get it. So, from okay. this perspective, not every. <laughs> I mean, I, the, I, don't, I really don't understand why. What well, you the way to point? Well, so, you're able to share verifiable credentials from any source. I mean, the, the practical problem that BC Court Services came to us was we need to provide access to these audio files for trans, like for uh, BC you know, court sessions to tr trial lawyers. We only want to give access to trial lawyers, even though we have like actually personal identification, like, like strong government ID in BC, that doesn't tell the BC Court Service that they're a lawyer. So how can they know they're a lawyer? Well, they could get the membership list from the Law Society, which they have, but now we have to match names. And you know, like matching names isn't a very reliable uh, way to, to link things. So we said, well, what if, what if the BC Court Law Society could give the lawyer something that they own and control that says they're a lawyer? And then the BC Court Service, which is the green, which is the orange box, can, can rely on that. And do it in a way that no, but do yeah. it in a way like we're not wiring any systems together here. Like the BC court system, and the and the law society system, completely independent. There's no connection. There's no. Someone need to, need to map identifiers. Yeah. So really yeah. No, you don't need to map any identifiers. They're holding a credential from the law society that says they're a lawyer. And all okay. we need to do is prove okay. that that's true. And this true. credential contains the name. It contains a name, but. Yeah, but that's that, you, that you in the end use to, to match the person that wants to get well, access no, to those. Well, no, no, actually, in fact, we could just say, are you holding a credential from the BC Law Society? We don't really actually like care. They care who they is only for tracking who downloaded the file and that they shared the file maybe later. But in this case, it's actually public information. 
So they don't mm -hmm. actually care who did it in some certain so sense. So it's, it's in the end, is it there, is it there a token that, that, that represents my ability to get access to that all the time? Or? In a sense. It's just no, like no, no verifiable tokens. credentials aren't bear tokens. It's not a bear token. I know. <laughs> so kind of. Well, well, they, well, they, well they, 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 they're not, though. They have a. It must not be tied yeah. to my personal identity. That's why I got from your statement. No, no, yes. How do they yeah. know that it's a. Like, what is it that the, that the lawyer has to give to uh, the court system? Like, are they logging in with something? There's no login, no. This is like the thing. It's like it? they go to. They'll be the issued it into the wallet. They go to the Law mm -hmm. Society's service, and because they're a lawyer and the Law Society knows them, okay. based on their identity proofing and their. Evidence so that they passed the bar and so forth. Some kind of identity proof. Yeah, the law society is responsible for maintaining their membership list under law, okay. right? That they paid their fees, that they proved sure, that they did does, pass like, the bar and so uh, forth. You know, if I'm a lawyer at home, how do I yeah. go prove? You're that going to have this identity wallet we call it here, and you're going to be able to receive a credential from the law society's web service using the agent software that we built, the Aries agent software. They're going to hold this credential on their phone. And when they go, like they like you saw in the demo here, they're going to go to the lost the court society's uh, sorry court services website, and they're going to push the button connect to that like with the verifiable credential. They're going to have to come up with some language that's better for users. And at that point, that protocol that's happening between the green and the blue is you know did a, a version of didcom, and then a version of verifiable credential exchange that says prove to me you're a lawyer, and the only proof I accept. As the as the court service is a credential issued by the law society with did X in the following fields name whatever, and when that proof occurs, the relying party now knows that they are. John, can I, can I, I don't yeah. see I don't see Alan Kay in here. Can I yeah. see Alan for a second? Yeah. The amazing part about what you're doing is that you're not verifying who someone is. All you need to all they need to know to access the lawyer party is that they're, they're an accredited. authorized. They're accredited so, lawyer. So what you're doing is all you're proving is that they're authorized. And that's the important part here. Not necessarily who they are. Yeah. And and, and that's that's the magic of what I haven't yet seen a really a good demonstration in this community in years that even attempts to address this. And I think you've done a fine job. It, no, it's not perfect. There's some you know, liberties you had to take with the existing protocols that aren't yet fully supported, but could be in the future. But you're demonstrating that what you're checking is authorization, not identity. And that's amazing. So it's more like real world where like as if the lawyer showed up in person and said, here's my membership card. And the person looks at it and says, oh, OK, uh, Joe, you're able to, here's your, here's your USB key with the files you need on it. How do they it. get that membership card in the first place? I guess that's why. They go to the Law says. Society's website. Okay. And they're this is they're going to log in there. Okay, okay. There and so we're relying okay. on the law society's integrity of that okay. particular thing. Now, now they could also end up using a verifiable credential, and saying, my "Here's my VC identity." You know. Thanks for, thanks for the information. From my perspective, the obvious alternative would be to turn that website into an open connect connector okay? yeah. and federate straight to it. Yes. Yeah. Yes, you can federate to it. But then every other service that needs to prove their lawyer has to call up and integrate the law society website. Yeah. Yeah. They also need to be a trial. With a, no, you don't. You like. I mean, no, but, uh, you can. You, just, I mean, prove you, me wrong. But that's what you're doing. You, you can, you can, you can achieve. If if they were an open ID provider, you can achieve it via a federation model, right? But the only the only difference between that is. Now you have a federated provider that could completely could could refuse your ability to authenticate or identify online, right? Yeah. Okay. So so yeah. Okay. That's use case specific, right? But you could have a provider that could choose for whatever reason to just say you're no longer allowed to authenticate. So if you have explanation of the of the advantage of SSI, I understand. Yeah. I get that. But in that particular use case. But in, but don't re yeah. forget that we have probably dozens of services just in government that rely on you being proving that you're a lawyer. Legal entity registration and a variety of other court services. Now all they need to do is install or use this uh, yep. green box, and, I, I and already lawyers are yeah. so like they use an open you know, for their website. It's a much right? much more yeah. powerful model than you know. I mean, th th I, honestly, on the internet, th there are no interesting attributes available. That 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 that. They right. just transferred an attribute that's available on the Law Society's website into a wallet. Mm -hmm. So they can transfer that via another no. protocol as well. That, that's a big but what step. if they go down? But now the that's lawyer, the lawyer can use that credential. Yeah. That's the, the, 
the 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 difference is is because. Oh, where is it? On my server. Oh, okay. And then that's there's one per per one. Yeah, this is digressive. This this is a very substantial contribution in in my view. Just just as a data point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The specification called uh, ISO 27551, I believe, Example of how to implement that. And then, uh, you know, so, the other process. So, 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 so just. I, I really appreciate yeah, yeah. what you have done, but I just wanted to find out. No, you're, no, you're right. Yeah. To re achieve yeah, the same yeah. things, and you need to compare what the pro. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. No one's, no one's disregarding that. You're absolutely right that you can achieve this, and and to. And point I, solutions, I, though, I think. I think this, this is the idea here is we can generalize this. But, oops. Um, I, now, now I want this like to finish up this discussion, but I unfortunately I have to make a call at 10.30, so I have to step out. But I want to thank everybody and yeah. thank the Matter team for yeah. their... Uh,